Now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. A very, very spooky syndicated series of programs, Murder at Midnight, directed by Anton M. Leder. Uh, you remember his suspense shows that were very, very terrifying. Uh, and this particular program was originally broadcast 76 years ago to May, today, March 7th, 1947, The Dead Hand. And we thank you for tuning in on this Tuesday edition. This is the 7th day of March, 66th day of the year, 299 days remaining. Alexander Graham Bell granted a patent for an invention he called the telephone. Here at the phone company, we handle 84 billion calls a year, serving everyone from presidents and kings to the scum of the earth. So we realize that every so often you can't get a call through. Perhaps your phone goes out of order for no apparent reason. Maybe you've been charged for a call you didn't make. We don't care. <laughs> Watch this. Just lost Peoria. You see, here in this computer room, we have a matrix of multi-billion dollar space-age technology that is so sophisticated... <laughs> We can't handle it, but that's your problem, isn't it? So the next time you complain about your phone service, why don't you try using two Dixie cups of the string? We don't care, we don't have to. We're the phone company. And I'm sorry if I'm going to offend some people, but a lot of phone companies are still that way today. Alexander Graham Bell patenting the telephone on this date in 1876. In Selma, Alabama on this date in 1965, state troopers and local law enforcement forcefully broke up a group of 600 civil rights marchers. The event televised and was dubbed Bloody Sunday. Sheriff Jim Clark thinking he could break up the civil rights march in the civil rights movement in Selma on this date in 1965. He didn't. Premiering off-Broadway on this date in 1967, the musical version of the cartoon hit You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Starring as Charlie Brown in the initial production was a young man who had become beloved as Radar O'Reilly and MASH, Gary Berghoff. 1969, Golda Meir was elected as the first female Prime Minister of Israel. 1973, the ultimately disappointing comet Kohotek, discovered by Luboz Kohotek. 1987, Mike Tyson added the WBA World Heavyweight Boxing title to his WBC title when he beat James Smith after a 12-round bout in Las Vegas. 1994, the Supreme Court ruled that parodies of an original work are generally covered by the doctrine of fair use. Of course, fair use is something that most of us in broadcasting understand, but that YouTube and their bots that monitor these sort of things don't. A gunman took hostages in the Salt Lake City Public Library hostage incident in this date in 1994. 2005, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice named John Bolton, the country's top arms control official, the next U.S. envoy to the United Nations. President Bush intends to nominate John Bolton to be our next ambassador to the United Nations. The President and I have asked John to do this work because he knows how to get things done. Bolton has been a polarizing figure in politics. He served from August 2005 to December 2006 as a recess appointment by President George W. Bush. He resigned in December 2006 when the recess appointment would have otherwise ended because he was unlikely to win Senate confirmation. Bolton served as the national security advisor under President Trump. 
Apple granted a patent to use the I, to the iPod on this date in 2006. And in 2011, reversing course, President Obama has approved the resumption of military trials at the U.S. prison in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, ending a two-year ban. Passing away on this date in history, film director Stanley Kubrick, country musician, songwriter Pee Wee King, uh, band leader, pianist Frankie Carl, and the man who sang about Don't Go on Wolverton Mountain, Claude King, all passing away on this date in history. Uh, this is the birthday to French composer Maurice Ravel. Uh, the U.S. Marine shown in the photograph of the raising of the U.S. flag on Iwo Jima, René Gagnon. Also comedian actor Alan Seuss, TV broadcaster Willard Scott, and Tammy Faye Baker. Turning 85 years old today, she was in the Indy 500 and in the Daytona 500. Janet Guthrie, 85 years old today. Hill Street Blues actor Daniel J. Trevante, 83. You remember the zombies? Tell her no, and she's not there. Great music from back in the 60s. Chris White, the guitarist for the zombies, 80 years old today. Jay Giles band performer Peter Wolf is 77. The Isley Brothers, Ernie Isley, 71. From Malcolm in the Middle and Breaking Bad, Brian Cranston, 67. Singer Taylor Dane, I'll always love you. Great music. 61 years old today. From The Office, Jenna Fisher is 49. From Bones, T.J. Thine is 48. Also uh, from... Uh, the 70s show, uh, Orange is the New Black, Laura Prepon is 43, and from uh, Tooth Theory and Tropical Thunder, Brandon T. Jackson, 39 years old. Those are just a few of the people who celebrate the 7th day of March as their birthday. And if this happens to be your birthday... Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. From 76 years ago today, March 7th, 1947, Murder at Midnight and the Dead Hand. I'm Wyatt Cox. Thank you so much for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Tuesday here on your favorite radio station. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station. Murder at Midnight, produced in New York City, distributed by the World Broadcasting System, the brainchild of Louis G. Cohen, the man behind the Quiz Kids, 52 episodes produced of the show, Robert Newman, the lead writer, and the director, Anton M. Leader. As we mentioned earlier, he had a big hand in the early suspense programs. Now from 76 years ago, March 7th, 1947, on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Murder at midnight. Oh, wait. Come back here. Wait, nothing. I said you were nuts. Crazy. And... No. No doubt. Sorry, Hook. Very sorry. But I had to have it. I'm going to have it. And once you're dead, you'll never miss it. Midnight. The witching hour when the night is darkest. Our fears the strongest. And our strength at its lowest ebb. Midnight. When the graves gape open and death strikes. How? You'll learn the answer in just a minute in The Dead Hand. And now, Murder at Midnight. Tales of terror and retribution by one of radio's best-known mystery writers, Robert Newman. 
It's titled, The Dead Hand. The small studio cottage on Dr. Martin Trent's estate, seated at the piano, alone in the gathering darkness, is Roger Blaine, the famous pianist, and playing as only he can play. must hear me. You must come here now to me. I'm calling you, Lorna. Calling to you in a way you could never resist. With my music, making your heart beat faster, your breath come quicker. Lorna! Hello, Roger. Am I disturbing you? Always, Lorna. Just as I disturb you as we disturbed each other since the first time we met. Martin's out at the hospital, and I heard you playing, so... That's not why you came, Lorna. You came because I called you. Because you promised you'd come and give me your answer. What we talked about last night, my going away with you? R- Roger, I-, I must have been mad. I-, I don't know what got into me. Don't you, Lorna? This is what got into you. My music. Telling you things I never could tell you in words. Roger, stop. I can't think when you play like that. I, I can't leave him. He's my husband. I love him, respect love. him. Can you love a surgical instrument? Can you compare what you feel towards him with what you feel toward now, this minute? No. No, it is different. Roger, how can we? He's your friend. It was he that brought you here, gave you the cottage. And haven't I given him anything? Music like this. Music such as no one has ever heard before. Roger, I... Lorna, listen to me. To what I'm saying here. I love you. I need you. It was you who helped me find depths within myself I never knew existed. You've got oh. to come away with me. You owe it to me. To yourself. To the world. Roger, you please. You want to. You know you want to. And you're going to. Roger, no, I... I, you're going I can't, to. I tell you, you are. I... You can talk to Martin when he gets home tonight. Tell him. I, I think he No, Lorna, there'll be no talking, no explaining. My car's outside and we're leaving right now. The music, my music, was still with me as we drove out through the gates, down the highway, pulsing, throbbing. Yes, I could hear it, but could Lorna? I glanced at her sitting there beside me. Happy, dearest? What? I don't know, Roger. You don't know? Don't you realize what this means, Lorna? I'm playing better than I ever played before, and this is only the beginning. After my New York concert, South America, then Europe. Roger, are you sure you love me? Me, as a person? My sure... Oh, what do you mean, Lorna? I know you've said you do, but... Whenever you've talked about it, Roger, ab- about us, you've talked in terms of your music. Roger, are you sure that's not what you love? Well, of course I'm sure. If I didn't have my music, if I couldn't play, I don't think I could live. But I it know. was you. You who lifted me to heights I never dreamed of, technically, emotionally. Roger, stop the car. Turn around. Take me back. What? Take me back. I don't understand. I do, for the first time. With Martin away so much, I was lonely, flattered by your attention. And your music was like a drug, keeping me from thinking. But now I can think. And I know you don't love me, and I don't love you, so please, Roger, take me back. No. But, Roger, can't you see? This whole thing was a mistake. It was not a mistake, and I won't take you back. Well, I'm going back, whether you take me or not, and if you won't stop the car... Laura, no, let go of that brake! Let go of that that ditch! Look out! We're going to... When I opened my eyes... I was in a bare white room in a hospital. Standing next to the bed, Lorna and Martin. Hello, Roger. How are you feeling? What? I... I don't know. 
What happened? You were out driving with Lorna. The car got out of control and you had a smash-up. They rushed you here to the hospital and... Smash well, you've up. been here for two days. Smash-up? Yes, I remember. Are you all right, Lorna? Yes, Roger. I was shaken up. Cut oh. a little bit. Oh, my hand hurts. Especially the fingers. Nothing happened to it, did it, Martin? I, I've got a concert in a few weeks, you know. Roger, it's... don't stop it. What? what? Why are you looking at me like that? Oh, I... Don't worry about it, Roger. Not now. Well, I've got to know. I've got to see... Roger, please. It's gone. My hand. My left hand. Martin. What did you do to me? Roger, I think you know how I feel about you. <laughs> about your music. You've got to believe me when I tell you there was nothing I could do about it. Nothing. <sighs> it was your hand or your life. My life? And what is my life without my music? It's nothing. Worse than nothing. A living death. Why didn't you let me die? Don't say that, Roger. We'll do anything we can. There must be something. Something? We... There's just one thing. You've got to get me another hand. We will, Roger. Hmm. There have been some wonderful developments in prosthetics no, as a result no, of the no. war. I don't mean an artificial hand. I mean a real hand. What? Roger, you're mad. No, no, I'm not. You took my hand and you'll get me another one. Oh, we'll talk about it some other time. You think right? I'll forget about it, don't you? Don't you? Oh, I, I won't. I say I'm going to have another hand and I will have one. And what's more, you're going to help me get it, do you hear? You're going to help me. I was able to get up and around a few days later. I didn't talk to anyone if I could help it. Because somehow I couldn't ever look at their faces, only their hands. Big hands and little ones, long-fingered ones and stubby ones. Yes, they each had two hands... And I, I to whom my piano meant more than life, had only one. Then, sitting alone one evening, I met Hook. I looked up, and there he was, a small, slight, sharp-featured man. Hello. Nice evening. Yes, I suppose it is. Uh, you mind if I sit down for a couple of minutes? No. I uh, wouldn't usually bust in on anybody except... To... Well, I'm getting out of here tomorrow, and I feel pretty good about it. Oh? What was wrong with you? A uh, bad heart. I'm going to have to take it easy from now on. It's going to make it kind of tough in some ways, but... Uh, you don't happen to have a cigarette on you, do you? Mm. Oh, yes, I do have. It's a... There... Well, at least I did have. Silver cigarette case. I can't seem... Is, uh... Fine. This it? What? Oh, yeah. Where did you find it? In your pocket. You you mean you, you took it? Uh, my name's Harris, Joe Harris. He usually called me the hook. Uh, oh. This is my racket. Or you rather, mean it was until I... Your pickpocket. Uh, well, one of the best in the business. But now with my ticket going bad, I guess I'll have to lay off. Except like now for a gag. <laughs> you didn't mind, did you? Mine? Well, certainly not. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, do you mind if I look at your hands? Look at them? What for? They're beautiful. As beautiful a pair of hands as I've ever seen. It occurs to me that you... You say that you don't know what you're going to do when you leave the hospital here. Well, I just hadn't thought about it much. Why? Now, I've got a proposition that might... It just might possibly interest you. No kidding. Why? Well, I'd rather not discuss it with you here and now, but I expect to be leaving here myself on Friday. If you'd like to come and see me sometime after You that, say where and when? Well, I've been staying at a little cottage on Dr. Martin Trent's estate. I'll probably be going back there. How about uh, Saturday night? Late, around 11.30. Fine. Okay with me. Then it's a date. I left him there, hurried back to my room. I wanted to be alone. Had to be alone, for I was afraid that what was on my mind might show in my face. It certainly was a date. A date with death. A man obsessed, half mad, and his unsuspecting victim. 
will both of them still be alive to hear it when the clock strikes 12 for murder at midnight. The only New York actor of note during this particular episode of Murder at Midnight is Lawson Zerby. March 7th, 1947, Murder at Midnight on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on this Tuesday. And the news from 76 years ago today follows these important words. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better. Mike Lindell and MyPillow launching the MyPillow 2.0. Now, when Mike invented MyPillow, it had everything you could want in a pillow. Now, nearly 20 years later, he's discovered a new technology that makes MyPillow even better. Of course, the patented adjustable fill of the original MyPillow, but now with brand new fabric with a temperature-regulating thread, it's the softest, smoothest, and coolest pillow you'll ever own. Say goodbye to tossing and turning and flipping your pillow over in the middle of the night. And more great news on the MyPillow 2.0 buy one, get one free offer with my promo code Wyatt. MyPillow 2.0 is 100% made in the USA, 10-year warranty, 60-day money-back guarantee. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the radio podcast square to receive the MyPillow 2.0, buy one, get one free offer, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Thanks for tuning in to Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox here on your favorite station. We're listening to an episode of Murder at Midnight, The Dead Hand, as it was originally broadcast on Friday, March 7th, 1947. In the newspapers of that Friday, 76 years ago, these were some of the headlines. The White House announced today that President Truman has postponed his Caribbean trip indefinitely because of developments. Presidential Secretary Charles Ross, who made the announcement, did not say what the developments are. All Ross would say was the Caribbean trip has been indefinitely postponed because of developments. A reporter asked domestic or international, and he said because of developments, period. The president, shortly before, had spent an hour and a half discussing Greek relief and other problems with his cabinet. The trip was to have started tomorrow. The presidential yacht Williamsburg, already in en route to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where Mr. Truman had planned to go aboard for a Caribbean cruise, he had expected to be away 16 days. John L. Lewis told the Senate Labor Committee today he has no suggestions at this time on how to prevent another nationwide coal strike. The United Mine Workers leader made that statement in answer to a question by Chairman Taft, the Republican of Ohio. Lewis suggested the committee that the miners' differences with coal operators would be settled if the government would cease using a blackjack. Those his words. After Lewis completed his testimony, Taft told reporters the next coal strike apparently will occur July 1st. He said he based this opinion on Lewis's reply to a question whether the mine leader thinks the Smith-Connolly Act will expire April 1st or July 1st. This is the act under which the government sees possession of the coal mines. Taft said he asked the question because I wanted to know when the next strike would come. John L. Lewis, grimly silent on his rebuff by the Supreme Court, marched up Capitol Hill to speak his mind on proposed new labor laws. The Supreme Court ruling which clinched Lewis's contempt conviction for ignoring an order to call off his damaging coal strike last fall left numerous lawmakers convinced that legislation still is needed to deal with walkouts which cause nationwide paralysis. But they were in the dilemma on how to go about getting such a law. The Bureau of Agricultural Economics predicted today business activity will fall off 5 to 10 percent in the last half of 1947 unless there is a quick drop in the cost of living. It said the setback would lead to a cut of 8 to 12 percent in income payments to individuals in the second six months of the year, force wholesale food prices down 15 to 20 percent, and possibly 20 to 25 percent 
off what the farmer expects to get for his crops this fall. An immediate drop in the cost of living and consumer durable goods would improve the outlook, the Bureau added, by causing real income of wages and salary earners to rise to a level consistent with continued high level of business activity. But it said such a flexibility in the price structure has rarely been observed. <laughs> Moscow newspapers gave seven-eighths of their space today a report on Soviet agriculture, which told a widespread embezzlement of land during the war and portrayed low yields in potatoes and pigs. The report by A.A. A. Andreev, the Soviet Union's leading agriculturist, submitted last week to the Communist Party Central Committee. Today's four-page papers gave it three and a half pages. <laughs> Budget cuts of about 34 percent for the Treasury Department and about one percent for the Post Office voted today by the House Appropriations Committee. In the first departmental supply bill sent to the House floor since Republicans won control of Congress, the committee made these recommendations for the two agencies for the fiscal year starting next July 1st. And in Edinburgh, Scotland, George J. Davidson won a divorce on grounds of cruelty today by demonstrating that his mouth was reddened by licking labels at the office and not by the lips of his secretary as his wife kept complaining. The demonstration was convincing to the judge who observed, jealousy is as cruel as the grave. And though some of the day's top news stories is reported in the newspapers of Friday, March 7th, 1947, on your radio, Murder at Midnight. The conclusion follows these important messages on this Tuesday edition of Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. Crime drama on Wednesday's classic radio theater with Wyatt Cox, Jack Webb, starring in an episode of Dragnet from 70 years ago, March 8, 1953, The Big Laugh. A thoroughly rotten louse cheats lonely women by promising to marry them. That's coming up on Wednesday's classic radio theater with Wyatt Cox, always online, classicradio.stream. Now the conclusion of Murder at Midnight from 76 years ago, March 7th. 1947. And now, here is Roger Blaine to continue Murder at Midnight. I did leave the hospital on Friday, went back to the little studio cottage. By Saturday night, my arrangements were completed. They weren't very complicated. I made it clear to Lorna and Martin that I wanted to be alone, and I picked up a length of iron pipe. The pipe I hid inside the piano when I heard footsteps coming down the path. There was a knock on the door. Come in. Hi. Uh, not too late, am I? No, you're not too late. Hey, pretty nice place you got here. <laughs> yes, it is quite nice. Sit down. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Now, what's this here proposition you want to talk to me about? It's a very simple one. How would you like to make $10,000? <whistles> what do I have to do? You don't have to do anything. Just <laughs> sell me something. Your left hand. What? <laughs> You're nuts. No, I'm serious. I've got the money right here in cash. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I just don't understand. Look, I'm a musician. I'm a pianist. Or I was until I lost my hand. If I can't go on playing, then life doesn't mean anything to me, my own life or anyone else's. But you... How important is your hand to you now? An artificial one will do almost as well. And you can live for quite a while on $10,000. You mean you really thought I'd sell you my hand? Let you cut it off? I'm getting out of here. Oh, wait. Oh, wait, nothing. I said you was nuts, but I didn't really think... Well, what are you going to do with that? No. No, don't you can't. <laughs> oh. Some way. Somehow I'll get you for this. I swear. I'm sorry, Hook. Very sorry. But I have to have it. I... rather not go into what happened after that. I... I got rid of the body. And then I went to see Martin. You don't look well, Roger. Anything the matter? No, I just came to see you about your promise. 
My promise? Or your debt, whichever you choose to call it. I told you I wanted another hand, that I was going to get another hand, and that you were going to help me. Well, now you can help me. What? What do you mean? Look in here, in this package. See? Good, good Lord. Where, where did you get this? It might be better if you didn't ask too many questions. I'm fighting for my life, for more than my life. You took my hand away from me. Well, now you can give me this one. You mean you honestly, seriously think that I can perform an operation of this sort, do a graft, and that after I'm finished, you'll be able to use the hand? Why not? Operations of this sort have been done, haven't they? With other parts of the body? The eye? The cornea, not the eye. And some nerve grafting has been done. But this... Look, Roger. I know what a shock this whole thing has been to you. Know it better than you. You're, you're not a well man. <laughs> a well man? I'm only half alive, and I'd rather be dead than go on living this way. But if I do die, I won't die alone. That's why I brought this along. Roger, a gun. Quick, easy, painless. If you won't do what I want, you die. And so does Lorna. Both of you, along with me. You, you don't give me very much choice. No. All right. You win. Get me the hospital. Even before I became fully conscious, before I opened my eyes, I knew, knew that it had been done, that it wasn't his hand anymore, but mine. And still, there was something wrong. I couldn't analyze what it was at first, but it was there. A feeling that something wasn't quite right. That perhaps... It wasn't entirely my hand. I sat up. The hand was a mass of bandages, stiffened with splints. And inside the bandages... Careful, Roger. Don't touch them. Huh? Oh, Martin, I didn't see you. I've been here with you ever since last night. Last night? You mean I... Uh, I've been out that long, 24 hours? It was very important that you keep quiet. You've been under sedation. Oh, oh yes, of course. But this isn't the hospital. No, I brought you home with me, back to the house. Oh. I thought it would be best for several reasons. Oh, that's very smart, Martin. We don't want any questions, do we? Not yet. But you did do it, didn't you? What? Uh, oh, uh, oh yes. I knew you would and could. And it's going to work. It is working, I can feel it. Please, Roger, you must be careful with that bandage. Hmm? You can't touch it, move it, disturb it in any way. I won't, Martin. But I don't have to. I tell you, I can feel the fingers moving, even inside this. And in another week or so... We'll see. We... Yes, we'll see. Got a cigarette, Martin? Of course, I have it right. <laughs> That's funny. Hmm? What is it? My cigarette case, it was right here in my breast pocket, I... I must have left it downstairs with the hospital. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I can do it. Without... Martin. Yes? I, I think... Here. Yes, here. Here it is. Under my pillow. What? How did it get there? I don't know. It must have fallen out when you bent over. But... No... Why are you looking like that? Because I think I know how it did get under my pillow. What do you mean? When fingers learn something, a special skill, they don't forget it, ever. Mine never have. Even when I'm not thinking of what I'm doing, they go on playing by themselves. These fingers here, they haven't forgotten either. Do you understand? I'm afraid forget I... It. Forget it. I'm awfully tired all of a sudden, Martin. Would you mind? No, Roger, I'd like you to get as much rest as possible. There's a friend of mine coming here tomorrow to see you. Another doctor. That's fine, Martin. I'll see you in the morning. Yes, I was tired, but that wasn't why I asked Martin to go. I did it because I wanted to be alone, because I had to be alone. Because I knew now what it was that I'd only sensed before. The hand. Hook's hand. Had a will of its own. It had picked Martin's pocket without my even being aware of it. 
I lay there alone in the darkness after Martin went, not touching the bandages, but flexing the fingers, forcing them to obey my will. I had to do that. I knew I had to do it because I suspected what might happen. And what did happen proved that I was right. I fell asleep finally. And while I was asleep, I dreamed. I dreamed I was walking down a dark, labyrinthine corridor somewhere under the earth. Then... A little closer, Roger. Huh? Just a little closer. Who's there? Who's there? Just me. Waiting for you. <gasps> yeah, hook. I said it get you. No, well, out of the darkness came a hand that clutched me by the throat, gripped it tighter, tighter, tighter. I fought against it. I tried to scream and, and woke up. Yes, I woke up. And my waking was more horrible than the dream, for the hand was there, gripping me by the throat, moaning, exerting every ounce of my strength and will. I fought it off and pulled it down. I lay there, bathed in a cold sweat, staring at it, feeling the fingers quivering inside the bandages. My hand or his, I was tied to it now, tied to a thing that was seeking to destroy me. Shaking convulsively, I leaped out of bed. I ran out into the hall and down the stairs to the living room, the piano. That was the one thing that might save me, save my reason. Seating myself at the piano, I started to play, using only my right hand at first, when I tried to force my left hand, his hand, to join in. Then suddenly... No, Roger. Oh. That won't work. Yes. No music. Stop it. Stop it. Do you hear it? It's my hand now. It's mine. No, Roger. Never. But it is. I'm stronger than you are. Nothing is stronger than I am. Nothing in the world. <laughs> and there's no escape. <laughs> Because we're one now, Roger. And wherever you go, I'll be there too. It's not true. It's not. What? What are you doing? Just a little closer no. to the desk, Roger. No, no. A little closer. That paper knife. No, you can't. But I can, Roger. No. I told you I'd get you somehow. Some way. No. Put it down. Drop it. You can't no. fight against me, Roger. I told you. I'm too strong. Martin! Lana! Quick! For heaven's sake! The hand! Ah! Yes. Uh, Where is he, Martin? The living room. I heard the piano and... Good, good Lord. Roger! He's dead. Why? How? He was saying something about a hand. He was in a completely psychotic state as a result of shock and a sense of guilt. The state psychiatrist was coming tomorrow to commit him. Oh, Martin. That hand he brought me wanted me to graft on. I, I don't know where he got it, but I suspect that was behind the whole thing. Behind it? Yes. Well, what do you mean? You don't really think I did graft it on, do you? Well, I... He was desperate, and I had to do something to quiet him. I splinted his left wrist, wrapped it in bandages, and told him not to touch them. But, Martin, that... Paper knife in his chest. Which hand is holding it? His right one, his good one. Yes. And still, in a way, it's possible that the dead hand, the one he was so concerned about, did guide it. Her eyes wide with awful comprehension, Lorna stares at her husband, then down at Roger Blaine's body is somewhere in the silent house a clock starts chiming for murder at midnight Remember to be with us again when death stretches out his bony hat and the clocks strike twelve for murder at midnight.
with music by Charles Paul. Murder at Midnight is directed by Anton M. Leader. Only 30 episodes of the 52 episodes of Murder at Midnight remain in circulation, and they are available uh, many places, and of course, always available through my friend Ted at radiomemories.com. Uh, check with Ted for any of your programs. Stop there first. He can supply shows for you on cassette, CD, or flash drive for your computer. Radiomemories.com. All righty. Uh, that was, by the way, Murder at Midnight. First episode of the series from March 7th, 1947, Lawson Zerby, as you heard one of the featured performers in the program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Would you do me a favor and uh, thank this radio station, support their advertisers. It is their kindness and courtesy that allows us to be with you each and every time we roll around here on your favorite radio station. Now, if you miss a day on this station, you don't have to miss a single show. All of our shows are available on demand at classicradio.stream. That's classicradio.stream. Stream our shows Learn about building a classic radio collection of your own. You can contact me, find our social media links. And if you're so inclined, if you'd like to support us, you can buy me a coffee. That buy me a coffee money goes to acquire additional great classic radio collections. That is at classicradio.stream. Thank you so much for spending part of your Tuesday with us. Would you tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the radio dial? Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station. 